pleased to uh, uh, welcome you now for this uh, second panel, uh, which will be dedicated to the issue of data governance. Uh, so this issue is intrinsically linked to that of the uh, uh, transfer and storage of personal data. And, and of course, all these questions are currently uh, hotly debated today. Um, uh, many of those who uh, follow the French news have heard about the controversy surrounding the Health Data Hub. Um, you probably know that the Health Data Hub is a platform that uh, gathers the, the health data of the French citizens. And um, it's the Microsoft Cloud that has been chosen to host, to host the health data uh, collected. And this choice of Microsoft has actually uh, been highly contested. Um, and not only because the contract with Microsoft initially provided for the possibility of transferring data to the US, but uh, also because even if the data remains stored in Europe, it is possible for American authorities to require the communication of the da data uh, by addressing directly the companies that provide uh, the storage. Um, so, so, you know, uh, uh, you probably know the, the story of uh, um, uh, the, the evolution of the rules regarding data transfers. Uh, you know that in 2000, the European Commission recognized the adequate nature of the protection provided by the safe harbor principles, but then in 2015, the Court of Justice of the European Union finally ruled that the safe harbor principles did not guarantee adequate protection for European citizens. Then in 2016, uh, a new agreement was concluded called the EU-US Privacy Shield. The European Commission validated the agreement. And once again, and it was a few months uh, um, uh, ago in June, the, um, the European Court of Justice decided that um, um, this new scheme uh, could, could not be considered as valid uh, in view of the requirements uh, of the GDPR and the Charter of, of, of Fundamental Rights. So the invalidation of the privacy shield has created real uncertainty as to the regime applicable to data transfers, especially data transfers to the United States. And even when it comes to the data stored in the EU, we are facing issues. Um, because in 2018, uh, the Cloud Act was adopted in the US. Uh, this statute allows the US authorities um, to oblige uh, the providers of communication services to disclose the content of communications. And uh, the fact that the data are under the control of a, US, of a US service provider is sufficient for US authorities even if the data are stored outside the US. So today, um, uh, uh, the question arises as to what strategy should be adopted in order to be able to effectively guarantee Europeans a sufficient level of protection. And to address these complex and fascinating issues, uh, we are fortunate enough to bring together today uh, a panel of uh, internationally renowned experts. Um, so um, we have uh, Theodor Christakis, uh, who is a, a professor of international and European law at the University of Grenoble. And he's also uh, a distinguished visiting fellow at the, at the NYU Cybersecurity Center. Uh, he holds a chair and the legal uh, uh, and regulatory implications of artificial intelligence uh, at the University of uh, Grenoble Alp. Um, and Theodore is a, a widely known expert uh, who uh, usually releases uh, thorough analysis on his blog. He recently released uh, um, a very fine analysis of the EDPB guidelines, and he will, of course, he will, he will talk about them. Um, Bruno Jean Carelli, he uh, heads the International Data Flows and Protection Unit at the European Commission. Um, he's been one of the lead negotiators of the, of the EU-US Privacy Shield and the Umbrella Agreement. 
Um, he is currently co-leading the negotiations uh, with the UK on all aspects relating to justice and consumers in the context of the Brexit. And this is the reason why it's uh, um, so difficult for him to uh, be with us because he's currently uh, negotiating. Um, he's also responsible for the adequacy talks with the UK. Um, um, and then, and last, and, uh, Professor Anupam Chander uh, is a professor as, at uh, Georgetown University. He's an expert on uh, global regulation of new technologies. Um, he is an adjunct senior research scholar at, Columbia at, the, at the Columbia University School of International and Public Policy. Uh, he is a faculty advisor to, to Georgetown's Institute for Technology, Law and Policy. He's also a faculty affi affiliate of Yale's Information Society project. And Professor Schunder has recently published a fascinating piece uh, entitled, Is Data Localization a Solution for Streams 2? So this is something that we uh, will have the occasion to discuss today. Uh, but for first, I'm uh, um, leaving the floor to Theodore. Uh, for his presentation. So Professor Kistakis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope that you can hear me. And I would like, uh, first of all, to, to congratulate Florence because she organized uh, this uh, great panel. It could be in a more topical way, uh, taking into consideration all the events of the last uh, days. And uh, what a fantastic panel uh, she put together. I'm so happy to be um, uh, with you, with Bruno and uh, um, Anipa. This is a little bit challenging because we have great experts in this panel and personally I would have loved to use my 12 minutes just asking questions to Bruno and Anupam. But at the same time we have all these uh, students who are not familiar enough with uh, uh, all these uh, issues. So I will try as much as possible. I, I, um, I will leave the questions to the students and I will try as much as possible to be uh, what we call in French uh, pedagogica and uh, to explain a little bit uh, uh, the context uh, uh, here. And um, uh, this is not going to be very easy because the issues, uh, um, the underlying issues are extremely important and extremely also uh, complex. So uh, I feel a little bit, uh, when Florence told me you have 12 minutes maximum uh, to summarize all this, uh, I felt like, uh, you know, in the Monty Python sketch, the summarize Proust competition, uh, where uh, each, uh, uh, each contestant has a maximum of 50 seconds uh, in order to sum up the seven volumes of Proust à la recherche du temps perdu. Um, so you can tell me at the end of Florence, well tried Theodore. Um, uh, I highly recommend you to, to read the, to go to the European Law blog and to read already the three posts were posted immediately after the six, uh, July 16th to all students, as well as uh, um, my recent posts on uh, the recent developments uh, the, these uh, last days and Anupam's great article uh, which was cited by uh, Florence. This uh, will be much better than uh, uh, what I will say to you here. So um, I would uh, um, uh, let me try to sum it, uh, sum it up in my 12, uh, uh, 10 minutes. Um, July 16, we have this second judgment, Trends 2, as said uh, Florence, uh, which invalidated the privacy shield. The privacy shield was uh, the main legal basis in order to transfer data from the uh, European Union to the United States. Uh, this was extremely important, that the big problem, because more than 5,300 companies were using this legal basis, and this led to a lot of uh, uh, legal issues and led especially to a new negotiation with the United States, and Bruno is in charge uh, of this, uh, this was the second time. The first time was uh, in Schrems 1 when the court invalidated Safe Harbor. In uh, last July, it invalidated the Privacy Shield. So now we're negoci negotiating a third arrangement. I don't know how we will we'll call it. Uh, Omar Tenney, our colleague, uh, uh, launched uh, a consultation and he proposed several names. Bruno is coming. Probably he will get, tell us what he likes as a new name for the third arrangement. So the, the choices were between privacy vaccine, data helmet, last chance or others and uh, the winner was i don't know what you prefer the winner was last chance uh so uh i don't know if the, this will be the last chance but uh, it, it won with 36 percent the second was data helmet as proposed name for the new arrangement 
But even a bigger issue after the 6th of July uh, was the fact that the Court of Justice posed very strong conditions for the use of other means for transfers, not only to the United States, but also to any one of the remaining 160 states, uh, sovereign states with which the European Commission does not yet have what we call an adequacy decision. There are only eight, sever eight sovereign states uh, with whom the European Union has uh, right now adequacy uh, decisions. And uh, more precisely, what the court said is that if you want to send data to the states, first you have to assess uh, yourself, all you companies, thousands of companies around Europe, if they meet the necessary standards as a legal system to be considered as adequate, uh, which was a no brainer, but uh, this is what the court uh, said that uh, everybody, each company has to proceed to this extremely difficult assessment, even difficult for us working for, for years and years on uh, surveillance issues, uh, difficult for the commission without doubt, because twice they were wrong. Uh, they said twice that it was okay for the US and the, the court uh, struck down. Uh, and the court said that if you consider that uh, the country towards which we want to send the data are not adequate, then you must apply a series of additional safeguards. So we're waiting to see what these additional safeguards are. And this is what happened last week. The European Data Protection Board, which unites all the data protection authorities, all the CNIL of uh, Europe, issued two very important documents to which I will um, uh, now uh, pass and explain you a little bit uh, the content of these documents. So to put it simply for students, uh, the Court of Justice closed all, mostly the door on personal data being allowed to leave Europe, but left open a lot of windows. And we're waiting for this European Data Protection Board to explain us which are the, the windows, eventually to open more windows in order to permit uh, uh, these uh, data transfers to take place. But we see in reality that uh, the European Data Protection Bo War, um, the Board closed a lot of windows instead of opening new ones. More precisely, the first document published last week was a document which uh, tries to make a compilation uh, of all the European safeguards and standards uh, that, let's say, a third country must meet in order to be considered as adequate. Uh, so uh, this was in order to help all these thousands of companies who will need to proceed to this assessment. And I called it in my uh, uh, papers, a surveillance law survival guide in the sense that if a foreign surveillance law uh, does not meet this requirement in this paper, then it would not be considered as offering a level of protection essentially equivalent to the one of the European uh, union. So I discuss the content uh, of this and uh, what uh, we see uh, in reality is that uh, what the European Data Protection Board did was very often to pick and choose among European jurisprudence, the jurisprudence of the Court of Luxembourg and the, the jurisprudence of the Court, uh, European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, the most, let's say, uh, the most demanding, the strictest standards because European law in this field is not a monolithic block. If you see the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, very often they're very different uh, um, uh, views. Uh, it, it's not always uh, the same view, one view. So we have this feeling that the, uh, the, the approach of the European uh, Data Protection Board is very demanding. And so I, at the end of the, the first paper, I asked, uh, uh, well, how many countries will pass the test uh, of these requirements? The US does not pass the test for the time being. This is what the Court of Justice said in July. China clearly does not pass the test. We don't even need to discuss. India does not pass the test very probably with the, its surveillance laws. Russia certainly does not pass the test. Russia has been condemned by the European Court of Human Rights in 2015 for its surveillance laws. And instead of changing its surveillance laws, it adopted a law uh, allowing it to uh, bypass, to overrule the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights in order to protect the interests of Russia. Uh, if you take the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights and the Court of Justice during these last years, Hungary, Rom Russia, Romania, Bulgaria, Moldova, Turkey, the UK, France and Belgium didn't pass the test in several decisions. So uh, this is why uh, uh, when companies assess, uh, uh, ask the question, may I send data to this country, X country, 
very probably the answer will be no, uh, unless if they are able to show that, uh, well, miraculously, the third country needs this very uh, strict uh, safeguard. Probably there are some countries, I don't know, Vanuatu or Nauru don't have a surveillance law, but probably they will miss the test for other reasons because uh, they uh, need to be democracies with very strong human rights standards uh, anyway. So, uh, which means that uh, what is extremely important is to assess the safeguards. Of, uh, in, in this case, if the country is not adequate, the only way to send data is to put in place what the court, uh, what we call additional safeguards. What are these additional safeguards? This is the second document published last week, and we're expecting this with a lot, a lot uh, of uh, interest. And uh, what happened is that the European Data Protection Board took an extremely restrictive and inflexible uh, position. Uh, first of all, by uh, rejecting what we call a risk-based approach, uh, which means that a lot of companies invited the board to say that, uh, listen, all the data transfers are not the same. I can send some data which are, are of no importance for intelligence agencies. You know, that, for instance, human resources or customer data, which are no, no important, where there is a very, very, very little likelihood of uh, a company of uh, uh, services, intelligence services, as, uh, uh, accessing, requesting this data from companies. So the company said, um, uh, well, if, if the risks are important, I will take very strong measures. But if the risks are not important, let me uh, eventually send data with measures, yes, but not extremely important. The European Data Protection Board rejected this view and uh, said, to put it very simply, because I only have three minutes remaining, that uh, uh, you need to use very strong technical measures. More, more precisely, they put in place the, the, the principle according to which if you want to send the data to a non-adequate country, make the data unreadable. How? Either by using strong encryption, uh, uh, so, and the importer does not have the key, or by pseudonymizing the data if the importer has no way of uh, identifying the persons which means that the only way to send the data according to the board and my interpretation of what they wrote is to make the data unreadable. Uh, and uh, uh, you can imagine that this could create a lot of disruption because uh, this will, uh, many companies will not be able to share their human rights and employee data. They will not be able to share customer files with their branches in the United States to operate intra-group transfers. Imagine, for instance, Renault uh, in, uh, in the United States, which wants to fix a call in order to launch the new Renault car, fix a call in order to put in place the strategy with Renault Boulogne. Uh, the, the, the guys in the US will not be able to consult the agenda of uh, the uh, Renault members in uh, Paris in order to fix uh, a call. This could lead to a lot of disruption. So what are the scenario for the future? I'm sorry, just one more minute, uh, Florence, I'm uh, almost uh, done. There are three scenarios, I think, uh, on this base. The, the first is what I call the gray zone, which means that companies might uh, be obliged in order to continue functioning to ignore the guidance, or they will not ignore it. They will pretend that they are uh, complying with this, but in reality, it will be very, very hard for a lot of companies to adopt this uh, encryption because they need uh, for the data to be able to read them in their branches in the United States. So these companies will enter into a gray zone. Uh, there are good reasons to believe that this might work uh, uh, because uh, the data protection authorities will not be able, be able to check everything. But this could, could include also a lot of risks, uh, especially there are a lot, a lot of uh, uh, lawsuits right now by activists against companies concerning this. The second scenario, it will be Anupam that will discuss it, it's data localization. So I wanted to say some things, but I think that Anupam will cover all these uh, uh, things and uh, he will discuss this, uh, data localization. And the third and the best scenario is to change the world. If uh, Europe does not want to lower its standards, uh, the only way the previous solutions are not satisfactory, then the only way is for Europe to change the world. Europe has already done so. The GDPR has exercised a major influence. A lot of countries, more than 120 countries, have modified their privacy laws. And this is something extremely positive and I highly recommend to students to read the Arnu Bradford, the Brussels effect, uh, because precisely uh, for several reasons, uh, the uh, foreign countries decide to adopt some good 
European rules. And in this field, uh, I don't want to challenge the safeguards, uh, the EU safeguards and surveillance. There are a lot of success stories, and these safeguards are an extremely important tool of convergence and a tool of fight against abuse and arbitrariness in, uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, surveillance issues are concerned. But um, as a matter of fact, Europe is changing thanks to the standards, but without blocking business transactions in Europe. So we have to find a way for other countries to adopt the progressively these standards and to negotiate. And this is exactly what Bruno is doing in his work, but without blocking uh, everything and business transactions. So what I, I find extremely important, and I will conclude with this, Florence, is one, this process of transatlantic, and not only Bruno is, uh, as we said, uh, in negotiations with the UK right now and other negotiations, and the negotiations with the US are extremely important. And uh, uh, I think uh, it, it could be a very good thing for the new Biden administration not to consider what happened last week as a provocation, but instead as a further proof of the need to work faster more strenuously together to achieve a solid and long-lasting transatlantic agreement. I personally believe it's perfectly possible and that it will be done. But while waiting, let's try to find a way and I'll make a lot of recommendations in my papers that I will not cover here, unfortunately, because I, I run out of time. Let's try to find a way so that we don't throw the baby with the bathwater. We must provide some flexibility for all these thousands of companies around Europe who need to transfer data to the US and other countries. And probably the best way to do so is to introduce a proportionate and risk-based approach to introduce the principle of proportionality back so that we will focus on the real problems and the real risks and adopt strong measures there while when the risks are very limited, enable the transfers to take place in a reasonable way. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Theodore, for this very uh, enlightening presentation. Um, you, you clearly uh, uh, highlighted the fact that data transfers uh, do not only concern the US, you also have other countries that are currently being assessed. Um, and I, I think this is uh, this, this fact that um, uh, this issue of data transfers is a global issue. Uh, will be uh, highlighted by uh, Mr. Jean Carelli. So, um, Mr. Jean Carelli, the, the, the floor is yours. So, thank you very much for the invitation. Very happy to uh, uh, to join you tonight. I just want to say you know, we thought, meaning we will have now then time uh, to to get into the, the the complexities and the details of this case. But I want to do uh, uh, to make three brief remarks about what this judgment and this whole saga uh, says or tells. I think it says something about privacy and data protection, and more generally about certain legal and policy challenges in the digital uh, world. It says something about a number of um, issues that are very hot right now around uh, Theodore, you mentioned localization. There, it, there's a lot of discussions around today around a, a broadly speaking, the notion of the so-called so digital sovereignty. I think uh, uh, that judgment may say something about uh, that also. And then um, it, it says also something about the role of um, a number of different actors which are involved like, uh, in, this, in, in, in these issues. The European Union through the European Commission, the US, other third countries, uh, companies, of course, and, and Data Protection Authority, Theodore, you mentioned uh, their the recommendation, for instance, of uh, 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 last uh, uh, week. So let me go very quickly to those three uh, uh, brief remarks. So this judgment is about actually data protection and transfers of data, but it's about a much broader issue. How to ensure the continuity of the protection of rights, in this case, the right to the protection of your privacy, but we could think about other rights. How to ensure that, that protection uh, in a um, a borderless interconnected digital world where you can move and why is data so much um, so much at the center of all this because data is something that you can move very quickly it, it takes a it takes a, a a click or two to move data uh, so this this issue about continuity of protection in a world which uh, uh, knows no border i'm talking especially of the digital world is a big challenge, and that's the challenge that this judgment addresses. One can 
agree with the uh, uh, outcome of, of this case, but disagree, have doubts, have questions, but that is, is the issue. Uh, and what that judgment shows and says to us is that privacy matters, has to be taken seriously, uh, uh, including in an international transfer uh, 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 um, um, in an international transfer context. And of course, international transfers are essential, are essential to almost any human activity. Trade, cooperation between public authority, cooperation, for instance, between law enforcement authorities, uh, uh, but also in COVID time, what we're doing now, uh, continuity of, of business, of government, of education, uh, uh, transfers are, also, are essential in, in, in our basic, almost basic human interaction. Think about the number of, of applications you have on your smartphone. So privacy matters. And that's, I must say, uh, I don't want to do, I mean, since I'm talking essentially to a French audience, I don't want to do uh, the usual Brussels uh, cocorico, but that's indeed a, a, a quite important uh, 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 victory uh, for the EU. Here you have an EU decision that has been quashed, but the EU has been insisting now for several years on the importance of privacy as, as a key component of a human-centered uh, 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 regulation of, of the digital world. That's, in a certain sense, the basic message of the GDPR, that finally privacy has to be taken seriously. And that's what the judgment is telling us. In a certain sense, the judgment is about privacy from theory to practice applied in the international transfer context. But I'm saying this is important for Europe, but what is also very interesting in this context, context is that this is, and that's, I think, a very positive uh, uh, development. Uh, the good news is that Europe is not alone in this, is no longer alone in trying to address these issues. And I want just to mention two uh, important and very recent uh, uh, and quite recent developments. First, uh, Theodore already mentioned it, so it's, it's easy for me to just uh, refer to what it says in terms of convergence. We are living in a world where in so many areas, unfortunately, there are different or divergent approaches. Privacy is the exception. In, uh, 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 in a very um, quite uh, limited uh, few years, we have seen, indeed, uh, uh, countries around the world which had which have modernized or adapted privacy regulations, uh, laws, new laws, modernized legislation uh, that share a number of common principles in terms of safeguards, in terms of enforcement mechanisms. It, it's happening in front of us, in front of our eyes, uh, from Brazil to, to, to Japan, from South Korea to uh, Kenya or California. Uh, that was one of the results of the electoral phases we had uh, in, in, in a, a season we had in the, in the US. Uh, and that convergence is very important because for uh, complying with the judgment uh, with, and for building a long-standing solution, we need that convergence through legislation, through robust enforcement mechanism uh, for, I would say, uh, long, uh, meaning for durable, viable solution in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, data transfer. That convergence in privacy is a, a, a very significant facilitator and enabler of data flows and uh, of free and safe data flows. Just to mention that the, something that is, everybody is very focused on the US, I understand this, but the EU and Japan created two years ago, the biggest area of free and safe data flows, building on the biggest area in the world uh, of free and safe data flows, building on the, the regulatory convergence uh, between their model. And then the other interesting aspect uh, is that this question, which is at the core of the core judgment, the interplay between privacy and governance access to data and national security, uh, uh, the fact that uh, you know, those are no longer two uh, uh, distinct, isolated words. A lot of uh, uh, the uh, collection and processing of data by, by government, by public authorities for very legitimate uh, uh, reasons, of course, uh, linked to law enforcement, linked to the safeguarding of national security, is about data which is in the first place collected for other reasons, uh, for commercial reasons, uh, 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 data which is uh, processed by social networks, etc., etc. And here comes that 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 interplay and that friction. And that's also an issue which is no longer a, an issue that only which is discussed only in Brussels or, or, or Luxembourg before the court. 
We see initiatives such as the uh, Japanese initiative Data Free Flow with Trust. We see initiative also in, in the US in the context, for instance, of the debate, but that's only one aspect of the debate uh, uh, um, uh, around the uh, security of networks, security of hardware, uh, that privacy is considered. There has been a, an initiative, clean network initiative launched by, by, the, by the current uh, US administration, which says, well, data is a strategic resource, uh, 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 as a strategic asset, and privacy is a, a, a very important element uh, 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 of trustworthy network, of trustworthy suppliers. Those are very important debates, but very new messages that you would not have heard a few years ago. Um, when we were going, when we were negotiating the GDPR and we were explaining, for instance, to our US counterparts what we were doing, the question even, I would say, three, four, five, six years ago was, why are you doing that? Now, uh, the, the question that we are getting is not so much why are you doing that, but how are you doing that? Uh, which, of course, makes it much easier. It's a question of why did you make that choice rather than another choice? Uh, why are you using that instrument rather than another instrument? What is the most important principle here that you're trying to safeguard, etc.? And I think that although, of course, Schrems too is a a, a, a judgment which is a source of, of questions, of, of concerns, of complexity, there is today at international level much more common ground uh, uh, than uh, there was only a few years ago to uh, uh, find, at least amongst like-minded countries, find some uh, common standards uh, on which we can uh, both uh, protect privacy and facilitate the data transfers which are so essential. So that's um, uh, what uh, 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 is important in terms of um, uh, 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 what does this mean about uh, privacy and uh, uh, certain uh, uh, legal and policy challenges in the digital in the digital world. Uh, the second aspect, and I think I won't have time for the third aspect. The second aspect I wanted to mention is um, what does this judgment say around the number of issues concerning that broad concept of uh, digital sovereignty or, 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 or related aspect. What is important? I've, I've heard you, uh, uh, Theodore, when you said the court closed the, 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 the door, uh, uh, but they didn't close all windows. Well, I would say more than that. The um, approach, I'm not saying that this is always easy, but in, in the area of privacy, the approach of the EU, not only of the GDPR, but also of the previous legal framework, is a, uh, an approach which combines two very important aspects, ensuring a high level of protection, but at the same time being open to data transfers and reconciling uh, those two objectives by having transfer mechanisms that ensures, as I said, a certain continuity of protection, basically ensuring that the protection travels with the data. But in the DNA, of European data protection law, you don't have, for instance, localization. This is not, we don't consider this as a necessary element of uh, uh, the protection of data. That the, that the EU should invest in its infrastructure, uh, invest in the digital economy, of course, huh? but here I'm talking about regulatory uh, uh, requirements. And I think that's uh, very important. Uh, and the court has kept that approach, has tell the, told us how we should ensure that continuity, how we should ensure that protection travel with the data, but has confirmed that approach, that fundamental approach of uh, 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 the data protection regime in the EU. And actually, it tells us, uh, and I've seen, of course, in France, but not only in France, I've seen and heard uh, the uh, debate about whether this uh, sort of change, uh, 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 change really the way in which we, uh, we, protect, uh, we should protect data. But actually, if you think, uh, if, we, if we think about what sovereignty uh, uh, should mean, again, in the digital world, which is, we might like it or not, but which is borderless, which is interconnected, 
we have the impression that sovereignty is much more about two other aspects. First, ensuring a level playing field, that if you offer services on goods in the EU and you process data in that context, you should be subject to the same rule, rules regardless of whether you are established in the EU or you are offering those services from abroad. Because today, of course, you can offer those services and goods uh, 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 while being uh, 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 seated in an office, in a, in a lab or somewhere uh, uh, thousands of kilometers uh, away, uh, away from Europe. So level playing field. That's a much more effective and, and, and uh, uh, way to ensure that indeed uh, our rules are respected regardless of where the uh, 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 provider of, of the services uh, uh, or goods uh, is established. And then the second aspect of that sovereignty is, uh, of that digital sovereignty is being able to contribute to the shaping of international standards. This is an area where there is a huge demand uh, for international standards. Uh, as expressed in many international organizations, OECD, Council of Europe, regional organizations such as ASEAN in Asia, uh, G20, G7, etc. And uh, here, uh, uh, one has to recognize that the EU has taken the lead. It's not me saying it, uh, that uh, 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 somebody like Chancellor Merkel has said data protection is an example where the uh, EU is a standard setter rather than a standard taker. And that should uh, 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 be used as a, a source of inspiration, as a model for other aspects of uh, the regulation of the digital economy, uh, such as issues around artificial intelligence. Uh, but it shows uh, that uh, uh, we can make it in a certain sense. And, and, and we can, together, of course, with like-minded countries, uh, take the lead. So I had, uh, but I think I've already spoken too long. I had uh, uh, also thought that I would tell you a bit more about uh, what we should uh, uh, say about the roles uh, of, of different actors. Uh, I can only tell you that, and I would only mention the actor uh, that uh, I, I know uh, 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 the best, which is uh, the European Commission. We are uh, uh, very active, of course, our uh, uh, um, number one, a uh, guiding principle is compliance with the judgment. Uh, you know how the EU is attached to the rule of law. The rule of law starts in Brussels and starts in Luxembourg. Uh, and on that basis, we have indeed engaged in a negotiation uh, with the US on a new uh, transatlantic um, uh, uh, arrangement for data transfers. These negotiations are ongoing. We have last week uh, uh, published new standard contractual clauses, which is a very useful uh, transfer mechanism, which try to uh, uh, draw some uh, lessons from the Schrems II judgment and, 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 and provide companies uh, uh, with uh, concrete tools to comply with that judgment while ensuring, of course, a high level of protection for individuals. And we are indeed uh, uh, working very closely with the data protection authorities, including the European Data Protection Board, to ensure that that judgment is applied and uh, 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 enforced in a uniform way throughout the EU, which is also a very important aspect of that uh, uh, level playing field I was uh, mentioning uh, before. Unfortunately, today is a very special day and uh, I, I will have to, to, to leave soon, uh, very soon. They are already making signs to me. But uh, of course, if there's a couple of questions, I'm, I'm very happy to, to take them. Okay, um, I think we, we are going to move on with uh, uh, Professor Chandra's presentation. Uh, and hopefully you, you will be able to stay a few minutes um, uh, to answer the question, but for now, I will I will leave the floor to Professor Shander. Thank you very much, Professor Cassell. Um, it's an honor to be on this panel. Um, I agree with my colleagues, Professor Kostakis and uh, Bruno Gancarelli, uh, and I apologize for mispronouncing Bruno's name. Um, uh, what what wonderful presentations, and it's an honor to share the stage with them. Uh, I'm going to share my uh, my uh, PowerPoint here and walk through it very quickly here. So, um, so the, the presentation I wanna offer is uh, the general argument that data localization is bad for Europe. Um, and um, 
and I'm grateful for Bruno's work in trying to ensure that that Europe remains open. Um, and so uh, very, very grateful. But but I joked, um, I like to joke that uh, perhaps now the new negotiation should be between the United States, not with the commission, but directly with the court of justice. Um, so so uh, because Schrems three will be the, is going to be uh, obviously some, will, will arrive yet again. Okay. Cross-border data flow has long been at the heart of uh, data protection law. Uh, so the OECD's guidelines on the protection of privacy uh, focused on transborder flows of personal data in 1980. The Council of Europe uh, borrowed these suggestions and uh, in, in a convention. Um, and the data protection directive, of course, the precursor to the GDPR recognized the critical role of cross-border flows. Um, that, which are necessary to the expansion of international trade. Uh, and so uh, the EU has actually been at the forefront uh, of these. Uh, so the, the EU Commission has, the European Commission has, for example, complained about India's plans for data localization. Um, and in a variety of ways, in a variety of contexts, its negotiating position has very strongly been against data localization. Right. So it puts the EU in an awkward position to be arguing against data localization for other countries, but practicing it at home. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, this is what Bruno uh, recognizes and the commission recognizes has been, and has been trying to uh, create, uh, retain Europe as a kind of open, uh, the European Union as an open space. The, in fact, the European Union's international position is good for Europe and the world. Um, and uh, really, uh, the European Union recognized the importance of uh, data flows to trade uh, before the United States did. Uh, so the Euro European Union has actually been a leader in this space in free flows, though we now associate the United States with, with, with cross-border data flows. The European Union was there uh, before the United States and recognized this in a variety of, of, uh, of uh, important documents. So the first uh, thing I wanna suggest and why this is good, not just this historical relationship between, uh, between European Union and its current negotiating position, but really that this is the right position to have for Europe. Uh, data localization, some suggest, will increase privacy and security, but the reality is that if you talk to, by, talk to cybersecurity experts, it's really a function of how data is treated, not the physical location where it's stored. Data can be hacked from anywhere. It can be mistreated anywhere. Uh, consider two companies that are quite European, uh, Cambridge Analytica, which is based in the UK, hacking team, which sells uh, its tools across the world for you know, um, illicit surveillance uh, or unauthorized surveillance in, in many cases um, uh, to, to uh, people all over the world, regardless of whether they are liberal governments or illiberal ones. Um, the other... Uh, claim here. This is a you know this will remind people of traditional kind of import substitution or protectionism claims. Data localization will build the local digital economy, and I want to I want to kind of contest that uh, quickly as well. Uh, the reality is that data servers are a small part of the digital economy, um, and so you know so. Um, here is a picture of a data, look, a data server farm, one of the uh, Google's largest data servers that is based in, uh, in Oregon. Um, one of the things I like to do, this is a satellite image. According to Wikipedia, uh, one of the largest. <laughs> so uh, my phone picked up my reference to Google and as uh, Google is always listening, uh, as it turns out. Uh, and so, uh, so, if you look in this, at this picture, this is an enormous, enormous building. If you also look closely, there are very few parking spaces. 
Um, and so the reality is if you've walked through a data farm, a uh, data server farm, you realize that it's all just computers. And the other reality is those computers are typically imported. Uh, and so uh, building a data server farm is largely a function of where one can get cheap and for many of these companies, green energy. Uh, this is built near hydroelectric power so that it can be powered using uh, more uh, climate sensitive uh, sources. And the other critical thing is that when you have protectionism, um, other aspects of the economy suffer. Everyone else who doesn't get, who isn't building out data server farms um, suffers from having to pay more for, for the loss of competition. Okay, data localization will spur the European industry, we're told. Um, in, in reality, data localization invites blowback from other countries, which will require data localization in return. Um, data localization in Europe will authorize data localization everywhere else that Europe trades. Europe is a huge exporter. Uh, and the idea that uh, Europe will be able to nicely shut itself off from foreign service providers while continuing to service uh, the rest of the world is fanciful. And as I said, it raises costs for European business and therefore um, actually uh, challenges European business. I drive a German car and my German car has on my phone an app that connects uh, me to the car. It's quite readily possible. Uh, I imagine that this phone is communicating with Germany or a data farm in Europe uh, in this while I, before I can communicate with my car. Okay, why would it do that? It wants to authenticate me, wants to make sure that I'm actually not a hacker. There's lots of reasons to want to make sure that my flows go from my phone through Europe uh, to, uh, to uh, my car. Uh, and so uh, requiring all these companies to localize their, their data servers across the world will mean is essentially either they don't provide this service or they pay a lot of money. Or thirdly, they just ignore the local law. One other thing is that you know there's a concern about trade law generally in this in this context. Um, trade disciplines are designed to allow nations to set their own standard of protection, um, and but the key aspect of it is they allow other states to meet that standard of protection. That's the way that trade law is written, uh, and so and it's it's a question I can discuss later. Uh, one of the other ar arguments is that hate speech is, um, is then abetted through American platforms. Um, and in fact, the First Amendment, um, yes, does tolerate hate speech. Uh, and that is, you know, can be certainly criticized. Um, but the reality is that companies are still subject to European law. And this is the foundational case in international conflicts of law, private international law regarding the internet, this the Yahoo case in France, where France, the French courts, the Cour de Cassation, and I apologize for my pronunciation, I apologize again, um, rightly insisted that Yahoo change what it offered in France to get rid of uh, Nazi materials that were arriving via uh, Yahoo auctions and um, through Yahoo GeoCities uh, website. Um, and even within Europe, Europe itself has had these issues. Um, so Telegram is a company which is a messaging service founded by uh, two uh, Russian brothers. It was for a long time headquartered in Berlin and it it allows anyone to use it, including white supremacists, et cetera. So it's, uh, you know, so the fact that you're headquartered or based in Europe doesn't uh, immunize you from uh, the presence of hate speech on one's platform. Um, okay. Um, and, you know, data, data is like money, it shouldn't be sent abroad. But the reality is that we know that, you know, like money, um, we know that we should keep it in the most secure vault it is rather than under our beds. So the safer the vault, the better you are, uh, the, the more secure it is. Um, China succeeded in growing the lo local digital economy through this process. 
And in fact, China didn't require data localization. That wasn't its strategy. It banned certain companies entirely because it can control the information they showed. A policy that liberal democracy should not emulate. Um, China's data localization law is, is very new and it has not been broadly implemented. And I actually have seen no evidence that it's been implemented at all. Um, so uh, data is like oil, it should be exploited at home, a version of, of the last two uh, arguments. And of course, you know, a, a kind of a broader view of this suggests that that is not the reality of, uh, of this. Data is not like oil uh, and it has a variety of other features that distinguish it. Um, data localization also is not just bad for Europe, it's bad for the developing world. It erects new barriers to services from across the developing world. Um, immigration walls to foreigners now join uh, it, are now joined by electronic walls to foreigners as well. It thus undermines sustainable development goals by harming the economic development uh, across the world. Uh, and so the, the irony of all this is that, uh, you know, Max Schrems targeted Facebook, but took down the uh, outsourcing industries across the world. Okay, uh, and so, uh, so and here are a few uh, bibliographic references for students, uh, which I will put in the chat. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Shander, for, for, for this presentation. We, we have like 20 minutes for questions, so you can write your questions. Um, I have, I have one on, on, oh, I can see that Bruno Jacarelli is back. Yes. So we already have a question for you, actually. Uh, thank you very much. So, so this is a question about uh, what you mentioned um, on the EU and Japan biggest data transfer two years ago. So the question is, did it respect the requirements of the European Data Protection Board today? Well, um, this um, arrangement, which is a, 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 um, a mutual adequacy finding in the sense that there's an adequacy finding, it's another sign of convergence as, as countries are converging around certain principles, they also tend to have similar um, uh, similar uh, transfer mechanism. And interesting, when Japan uh, modernized its uh, 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 data protection legislation, it's also introduced uh, the so-called adequacy instrument, which is a, a finding by which you authorize the transfer to another country, which provides for a similar, uh, similar level of protection. So uh, the, uh, this decision was adopted uh, after the Schrems 1 judgment and before the Schrems 2 judgment. Uh, uh, as I mean, if you're interested, this decision is online and you will see it has a very detailed assessment uh, of uh, the Japanese system, including of the issues which are at the center of the Schrems 2 judgment. So issues concerning uh, a particular intelligence services, national security access to data. Um, the each system is, of course, uh, uh, different, but we find that indeed the Japanese system uh, complies with requirements around proportionality of access, necessity of access, availability of judicial redress mechanism, uh, independent oversight mechanism. Uh, let's not forget that adequacy doesn't require a point-to-point -point or an identical level of protection, but a similar level of protection, which um, is, um, uh, uh, which uh, uh, similar to the one uh, 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 guaranteed in the EU, and that's what we found with respect to Japan. Of course, and that is the last element I wanted to mention. Uh, an adequacy decision is a certain is a is certain finding uh, uh, is a finding uh, of a level of protection at a certain point in time. is a is a sort of snapshot. Uh, of course, uh, 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 systems in the EU or abroad might evolve. And that's why each adequacy mechanism has a review, a review uh, process, an evaluation process, which we will have with Japan next year. And, and at that time, uh, at that point, we will be able to, to assess whether uh, uh, the uh, uh, adequate level of protection is still ensured, including in light of the uh, most recent case law of the, of the Court of Justice. Uh, but we believe this is a very strong arrangement uh, it's also an arrangement which is big on specific additional safeguards that we negotiated uh, with Japan to, to make sure indeed that all the requirements were met. 
Okay, so thank you very much. So I will, I will of course, uh, uh, take the other questions. I, I have one myself. Um, so I've, I've, of course, I've been very much interested by, by those arguments against uh, uh, data localization. Um, we are currently having this discussion right now because um, we, we have been um, discussing the perspective of a sovereign cloud in France uh, over the past like, 10, 15 years. Um, we are currently discussing um, the possibility of um, um, uh, European sovereign clouds. Um, so this could be called data localization. Um, but this is the reason that is usually given uh, for these projects is just the fact that we can see certain countries and especially the US that do not have the same level of protection. Um, and as was uh, highlighted previously by Bruno Giancarelli, for example, this very high level of protection um, is, is key. It's, it's at the heart of our conception of privacy. And if I quote the first uh, Schrems decision, for example, um, what, what the European Court of Justice said at the time um, uh, was the fact that those data transfers um, compromised the essence of the fundamental right to respect for private life, um, uh, given the, the conditions at the time. So, so um, uh, should, should we um, lower our expectations? Uh, should, we do, should we have lower protections or should we impose those protections to others? Uh, should we negotiate with the US in order to have um, uh, more guarantees? when data are transferred uh, to the US. And this is probably related to something that has just been uh, uh, mentioned, which is the fact that, for example, in California, uh, there is today um, a data protection law um, that is actually highly protective. And, and maybe we could expect uh, something. And it's just a question here at the federal level. So, so this is, broadly speaking, my question. Should we lower our expectations? Should, could we expect uh, from the US that, that, that the US regulation be uh, reformed in order to offer more protection? So I, I, I'm currently asking, so maybe you could just all three give, give a few, say a few words about this. Yes, Theodore, please. Yes, Florence, I, I would like to take advantage uh, uh, to answer both to your question, to try to join with a, with a really great question that I have in the, in the chat. Uh, so if I could combine your question Absolutely. with the one uh, asked by Anouk, uh, uh, who wrote, hello, everyone. Uh, I have a question regarding the risk-based approach. How realistic is it? to attempt to rate what data is at high risk of being used by surveillance agencies when the policy of those surveillance agencies is often to, catch, uh, uh, to adopt the catch-all approach. So uh, let me start by your question, and we'll come to this one. Um, you said, should we lower our expectations? No, I don't think that we should lower expectations. Bruno explained very well uh, that uh, our expectations are uh, changing, first of all, Europe, because in Europe also there are a lot of, uh, there, is, uh, there was such huge progress. Don't, don't think that because we adopted the GDPR, everything was done, there, there was a huge progress of, uh, process of compliance. And in relation with surveillance safeguards, well, every time that we have a surveillance, or almost every time with very few exceptions, we have a surveillance law which arrives at Strasbourg or Luxembourg, they say that does not meet the standards. Only recently, only Sweden was able to pass the test of the European Court of Human Rights, and even this case was referred to the Grand Chamber. And probably the Grand Chamber will come um, uh, in a few days or months to say that even uh, this case was not uh, compatible with the standard. So it's a process of convergence. That I think that this is a key word that we should keep. A process of convergence. It's very important to have these standards in order to be able. You know, surveillance techniques are becoming every day more and more sophisticated. It's, it's crazy what we can do with surveillance right now. We definitely need, and this is the big strength of Europe, uh, to have the standards and to try. But the big issue is not to lower our standards. The, the big issue is while we try precisely 
to, to, to export, to influence to, uh, the, the other countries so that we assure a, 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 an adequate level of protection, uh, we should not block everything. And this brings me to the, to the second question, which was, uh, well, how realistic is to proceed to such a risk assessment, which was uh, what I suggested at the end of my intervention. Of course, this is a major question, and you're right, it's not going to be easy. Well, what the court is asking also, the European system is asking not easy, they are saying to uh, thousands of companies all over Europe, each one, do, do you imagine being a small startup or an SME, you want to export data and they ask you to India, for instance, and they ask you to assess uh, whether India meets uh, the safeguards. I mean, it, it's, it's a no brainer. Uh, uh, once again, you, you need to have the best lawyers. Nobody, only big companies can pay this. And even these companies can get it wrong. So you see the process is difficult. So of course you say, if we add a risk assessment, a risk-based approach, it will be even more difficult. Yes, but companies will prefer these difficulties anyway than a total disruption. Uh, if we adopt what the, the EDPB said, uh, then it will be uh, 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 don't transfer data unless if you can encrypt it, we, which is will be completely unrealistic for, for most of companies. So the big issue is how to introduce back proportionality. The whole GDPR is based on this risk-based approach, which means what? Which means, of course, there will be some risk sometimes, but you have to assess the risk. There are big risks, there are small risks. While we're talking, there is a risk that there will be an, uh, 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 an earthquake, a major earthquake in Grenoble, in the Alps, uh, of nine in the uh, Richter magnitude, uh, which will destroy my house. But this does not make me go under the table in order to talk to you. Uh, uh, if, uh, if the risk is small, then I will adopt probably, uh, you know, uh, measures which could not be dramatic. If the risk is huge, I will adopt much more important measures. Let me give you just a very practical example, because you talked about Cloud Act, and of course, we, we cannot in such short time uh, discuss everything, but it's very related to these risks. There was a case very a few days ago in Germany where a German state government wanted to use a messaging service provided by US provider AWS, which was called Legineo for messaging in school between uh, parents and, uh, and the administration, uh, et cetera. And so some people said, well, don't do this because probably American US services will have access to the data uh, on the basis of the Cloud Act. I'm not explaining you here Cloud Act, but for the Cloud Act, I mean, total anarchy, the Cloud Act, you need to have a warrant by US judge on the basis of what we don't even have in Europe, which is a probable cause. And of course, there are other risks that I have highlighted in my publications, but you have to assess the risk. In this case, the German state, North Rhine Westphalia, uh, assessed the risk and they said, hey, listen guys, the probability of a U.S. judge issuing a warrant on the basis of probable cause in order to access the mes messaging service of the school is almost serious, extremely limited. So we can use this service. So this is what I'm proposing, the idea that, uh, of course, we will have risks if the uh, country does not have other But we have also risks in Europe, we have other kinds of risks. So you have to assess the risk if the risks are important. There can be some important risks sometimes. We should protect our companies, for instance, from uh, the Trump administration assessing the data of some companies in order to do what they did with BNP uh, Paribas and impose huge fines for violations of unilateral sanctions of the US against Iran. This is the kind of things where we have to adopt very strong measures to prohibit. To, to avoid these situations. But we cannot just say that because there is a, a very hypothetical, very small risk, we will bring the whole building of international data transfers down because it will harm our companies and we'll go back to what Anupam said. So what Anupam said, it was fantastic. He said, let's adopt the best possible solution uh, all the time. This is what is proportionality is about. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Theodore. I, 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 I have the impression that uh, Bruno Jancarelli had to leave us. Uh, but no, no, maybe... I'm here. Oh, okay, okay. It's, it's, it would be fantastic if you have um, uh, a word or two about this. Yes, uh, I, I, and then I will indeed have to leave. And again, very sorry, all this was not, of course, uh, I didn't expect such a day when, when I accepted your very kind invitation. And even when we have busy day in general, I try to... Uh, of course, to fully participate in, in, to, in such events, but tonight it's really very difficult. I just want to uh, agree with what Theodore has said. By the way, the risk assessment, principle of risk assessment is 
together with accountability, is at the core of the GDPR and is at the core of the Schrems II judgment. What, without entering into the technicalities, one of the reasons for which the court, the key reason for which the court has confirmed the validity of the so-called standard contractual clauses, which is a transfer mechanism, is because those standard contractual clauses require to carry out a risk assessment of your transfer. And that carrying out that risk assessment of the transfer is a case by case exercise, which for one single country may lead to different results in light of the nature of the data, the type of business model, the volume of the transfer. So let me give you a very uh, simple example. In terms of likelihood, and I know the EDPB, the European Data Protection Board, doesn't like that term, of access, uh, the situation are very different. If you transfer, for instance, human resource data, which is unlikely, also based on your own experience as an exporter and importer of data, which is unlikely to be of interest to uh, 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 um, intelligence, for instance, agencies, compared to other type of data, for instance, if you are a social network. That type of reasoning, which is, by the way, very much also uh, into the uh, standard contractual clauses we have proposed last week, is uh, fundamental uh, in uh, uh, trying to understand and apply what the court has said. Uh, in most of the case, of course, you will have countries which have such a system uh, in terms of uh, absence of to to total absence of any rule of rule of law of any review that then transfer might be problematic. But in many situations, the, 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 the lawfulness of the transfer will very much depend on Again, the nature of the transfer, who is the addressee of the transfer? Uh, what kind of laws applies uh, to, that, to that addressee? And uh, 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 it's very important to, to stress that uh, the fact that the judgment is, is not a binary judgment, it's not a black and white judgment. It requires a lot of effort in terms of assessing those risks. Uh, and that's why indeed, together with the EDBB and in our SCCs, we have tried to provide companies a toolbox listing the different factors and elements that need to be taken into, into account, both in making that assessment and in also, because the Court of Justice doesn't stop that, it says, even if you identify a risk, there are ways to mitigate that risk, limit that risk. Of course, encryption and security have been mentioned, but there might be other ways uh, and other means that are adapted, that should be proportionate, of course, to the risk. And uh, once again, this is the approach we, we have followed uh, in, in ICCs. I cannot enter into uh, more details. And once again, I apologize uh, uh, for having to, 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 to leave uh, the conversation now. Uh, I, uh, uh, for what I could uh, uh, hear, uh, I very much enjoy it. And um, uh, thanks again for, 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 for the invitation and for the opportunity and, and hope to, 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 to have soon a, a possibility to continue that, that very important conversation. Thank you very much for joining us in, uh, and for all those uh, uh, um, enlightening remarks. Um, so I will now turn to uh, Professor Shander if he, he has uh, something to, to say about all this. Uh, and maybe we can join this with um, a question what, that we have in the chat about, about China. Um, um, do you think that data localization is likely to be more chosen by authoritarian countries? for uh, security concerns. So uh, first of all, let me commend your students uh, for asking brilliant questions. Theodore already commended them. And I agree that the, uh, your students are, are doing a fantastic job um, and uh, posing provocative questions to, to all of us. So I think that's exa exactly what we want in the next cadre of leaders. So thank you. Um, so I just wanna make a, a couple uh, observations. First, picking up on Theodore's excellent point about the Cloud Act. The Cloud Act requires that there be a search warrant issued under with probable cause with a crime for which a US court has subject matter jurisdiction. Instant messages of German students are likely not to reach uh, any of those uh, constraints. Um, and so a risk-based approach makes sense. Um, you know, we don't want to kind of go crazy about um, 
totally remote possibilities and stop, you know, all kinds of stuff. The other, you know, for, for if you were worried about remote possibilities of American intelligence, you would say, don't use data at all. Okay, right? Because American intelligence doesn't just operate within the 50 states of the United States. American intelligence, you know, rightly operates across the world. Um, and so, and in fact, it's least constrained as it operates across the world. Okay, so this is a point I make in, a, in the paper Data Nationalism. Um, the idea that you escape um, foreign country scrutiny by keeping the data at home just misunderstands the, the actual nature of signals intelligence today, uh, which is putting these, you know, uh, these listening devices wherever they can, uh, compromising individuals. You don't have just to compromise people on the basis of your incorporation. You can compromise people on lots of different bases. Um, and so, you know, the idea that an American provider will say, always jump to the attention of a, a of, of this, despite foreign law, uh, despite then running into all the problems of losing its business in Europe, if it's found out um, that it's you know sharing this information uh, in this way, the Snowden revelations uh, caused huge changes in practices, including, for example, the companies encrypting data between their own data servers because they realized the data servers that they had in Europe were being uh, were being uh, hijacked, um, and so they encrypt the, the backhaul data uh, in their own uh, systems. So, so a lot of things have happened. I think that make it make that important. The great question uh, posed by a student named Ifang um, uh, about China. Um, so Google retreated from China a decade ago um, because of concerns that it's collection of information would be then subject to uh, uh, being commanded by Chinese authorities. It still tries to provide services in China uh, and it does provide some, uh, you know, Android, uh, the Android platform operates in China, for example. Um, so what, so Google now doesn't run its servers in China at all. Apple does still provide you know, a huge amount of servers in China. It subcontracts with a local company in China to, to locate servers because it sells iPhones directly and it needs to uh, you know, provide uh, fast access to these things. And that raises these exact surveillance questions that I think are very serious. I have a paper called Googling Freedom uh, a decade ago discussing these, these difficult questions. And it's very, you know, these are very hard questions. Um, the question that iPhone poses is ultimately, as Florence, you've uh, rightly uh, focused on, is the question of are authoritarian states more likely to impose data localization? What I argue is that data localization is a kind of second generation of internet border controls. The first generation was data can't flow in to our country, okay? Because why? Because it's kind of, you know, it's the kind of speech that we don't like, okay? And think the Great Firewall of China. The second generation of internet border controls is data can't flow out, okay? And you put those two generations together, suddenly you control the whole information environment if you can make those two border controls uh, you know, if you can successfully enforce both those border controls. So totalitarian states will find a ready ally in Western states uh, adopting data localization because it gives them uh, a basis on it, uh, uh, for asserting data localization obligations uh, in their own countries. So I think authoritarian or then increasingly totalitarian states will, will indeed uh, adopt data localization as a practice. And I think that's another reason, that's a huge fundamental reason that I think we should, um, in liberal states, uh, avoid data localization. So I'll stop there, There's, but great questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. Actually, I've just I've just looked at, at the at the clock and it's seven twenty already. So so I we didn't see the time uh, uh, flying. 
uh, but it's 7.20 already. We should, we should be finished uh, already. Um, so I want just to- ask uh, very quickly, just one yes. minute, very, very quickly. Will yes. other decision with other states such as Canada be reviewed? Well, not automatically, but we cannot exclude that there might be a challenge similar to the one you know, that uh, uh, Schrems presented twice against uh, the US, in which case uh, there might be a kind of reviewing by the Court of Justice. This is the first, I, I hope it was responded. And the second, how often data transfer violations enforced by the EU? Well, we have these cases, uh, Schrems 1 and Schrems 2, but there, there, are no, there, is, there are no other cases similar to this. Just to answer, you know, I'm very happy to see Pade question there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Theodore, for taking the time to answer everything so quickly. Um, so thank you uh, again to uh, all our panelists for joining us today and sharing with us uh, all they know. Uh, so uh, again, I, 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 ex I expect and I hope that we, we will have other occasions to discuss um, these topics. Um, and you've all mentioned uh, your uh, respective works. Uh, I think uh, the students have much to read now, uh, which is another good news. Uh, so thank you uh, again and um, and see you very soon. So all this has been recorded uh, and will be of course made available on the on the share website. Mm -hmm.